Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cast Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 712 for July 8th, 2018. Coming up in just a few minutes. You know, if this thing was just about making money, I never would have sold the party source. It was, it's always been a highly successful operation. Uh, I was kind of on easy street, but this is a great second act for me. And it's all about quality. And it's all about having a fantastic team and building a product and becoming a great small distillery. And there's a source of pride and passion and determination. Ken Lewis started New Riff Distillery in Newport, Kentucky four years ago as his New Riff on Life. After stepping away from a successful career owning the party source liquor stores in Northern Kentucky. New Riff has been selling the OKI sourced bourbon for most of the last four years, but those days are over. At the end of this month, New Riff's first whiskey of its own will hit the market, a bottled in bond four-year-old bourbon. That's a big statement for a new distillery's debut whiskey, but Ken Lewis has a history of challenging the status quo. He'll join us later on Whiskey Cast in depth. That's coming up soon along with the calendar of events, your voice behind the label, and the what I'm tasting this week department, all on this edition of Whiskey Cast. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, know Redbreast. You might notice a little more background noise than usual in this episode, and that's because it's a beautiful sunny day here in the charming yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. So we're recording this show on the front porch, sitting in the porch swing. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. That mid-afternoon rumble heard around Bardstown, Kentucky on the 4th of July was not fireworks. Twelve days after half of Barton 1792 Distillery's Warehouse 30 collapsed with 9,000 barrels of whiskey inside, the other half came crashing down on Wednesday afternoon with another 9,000 or so barrels. Once again, there were no injuries, but this time, the distillery had crews ready to keep any spilled alcohol from reaching the nearby Withrow Creek and Beach Fork River. Around 120,000 gallons of whiskey flowed into two large retaining ponds. The June 22nd collapse killed as many as 1,000 fish after whiskey flowed down the hill from the warehouse into the river and creek. But this time around, State Department of Environmental Protection officials say not a single dead fish was found. That second collapse was perhaps inevitable, since structural engineers had never been able to stabilize the building enough to allow workers to safely start removing barrels and debris from the first collapse. Sazerac executives say it'll still be several weeks before they know how many barrels can be salvaged from the debris pile, and figure out what caused the collapse in the first place. In the meantime, plans are being prepared to build a new warehouse to replace the collapsed one, and Sazerac has also confirmed for the first time that inspectors have examined all of the other 28 warehouses at Barton, along with the Buffalo Trace and Glenmore Distillery warehouses. All of them passed inspections. Let's update the trade war now. China's new 25% tariff on American-made whiskeys went into effect on Friday. It's the latest attempt to use whiskey exports as a way to retaliate for the Trump administration's tariffs on imported steel and aluminum, and just part of a much larger trade conflict between the U.S. and China. According to the Distilled Spirits Council, the U.S. exported almost $9 million worth of whiskey to China last year, That's almost 75% of all 2017 U.S. spirits exports to China. The Council has been promoting U.S. spirits sales in China since 2007 and called on both countries to resolve their differences soon. 
Lots of new whiskeys announced this week. We'll start with one that survived another disaster, the Heaven Hill Fire of 1996. Heaven Hill's 27-year-old barrel-proof small batch bourbon comes from 41 barrels that were filled in 1989 and 1990 at the old Heaven Hill Springs Distillery in Bardstown. The whiskey came in at a natural strength of 47.35% ABV. It'll go on sale in limited amounts this fall. Fewer than 3,000 bottles will be available at a recommended retail price of $399 each. The Balvenie is releasing a new edition of its 50-year-old single malt. Only 12 bottles of the Balvenie 50 Marriage 0962 will be available. And that 0962 refers to September of 1962 when malt master David Stewart joined the Balvenie. The whiskey comes from four American oak casks, and it'll be available at a handful of UK retailers for a recommended price of 27,500 pounds, or about $36,500 US. Meanwhile, William Grant & Sons is also refreshing its Grant's range of blended Scotch whiskies. The flagship Grant's Family Reserve will keep the same liquid but starting next month, it'll be known as Grant's Triple Wood to reflect the refilled bourbon, virgin oak, and American oak casks used for the whiskies that make up that blend. There will also be a new Triple Wood smoky version that uses more peated whiskies in the blending recipe, along with a new rum cask finish and an eight-year-old sherry cask finish. Both of those will be available starting this month. Chivas Regal is releasing a new 15-year-old edition that uses Grand Champagne Cognac casks. It's available now in travel retail with a recommended retail price of $69 for a one-liter bottle and will be available at whiskey shops worldwide starting in October. Aaron is unveiling a new series of limited edition single malts. Brodick Bay is the first release in the Explorers series which celebrates the landscape of the Isle of Arran. It's a 20-year-old single malt finished in Oloroso Sherry Butts and will go on sale this Tuesday at the distillery and the Arran website for 130 pounds a bottle. That's around $173 U.S. Bladnock is releasing a new limited edition 10-year-old single malt. It's finished in an ex-bourbon cask and bottled at 46.7% ABV. It's available through the Whiskey Exchange for 60 pounds. That's around $80 a bottle at current exchange rates. Saturday was World Chocolate Day, and Douglas Lang & Company has released a new chocolate edition of its Scallywag Speyside blended malt. It's matured largely in Spanish oak sherry butts and was blended to bring out cocoa and dark chocolate notes. The Scallywag Chocolate Edition will be available exclusively through the Douglas Lang website with just 300 bottles available. No word on pricing. Morrison & Mackay is releasing a new Carnmore 11-year-old Altmore single cask bottling this week at the Goodwood Festival of Speed in England. The reason? It's a special bottling to mark the 50th anniversary of racing legend Jim Clark's death in a crash at Hockenheim back in 1968. Proceeds from the 400 bottles will go to the Jim Clark Trust to support work on a new Jim Clark Museum in Duns, Scotland, the borders town where Clark lived. The Trust is also the official charity for this year's Goodwood Festival of Speed, which gets underway on Thursday and runs through the weekend. Jim Clark won the Formula One World Championship twice, along with the 1965 Indianapolis 500. And by the way, past Whiskey Cast guest and three-time Indy winner Dario Franchitti told us on Twitter this weekend he's already put in his order for a couple of bottles. The Lakes Distillery in England is releasing what it calls a cross-border blended malt. Steel Bonnets blends English and Scotch malt whiskies and gets its heritage from the border marches of England and Scotland during medieval times. It's available through the distillery's website. The price? 65 pounds a bottle. On the Irish whiskey front, Walsh Whiskey has released the second edition in the Irishman's Founders Reserve Cask Series. 
The Caribbean cask finish is a blend of Irish single pot still and single malt whiskies finished in Caribbean rum casks from St. Lucia distillers where they were used to mature the Chairman's Reserve rum. Each of the 12 rum casks was bottled separately at 46% ABV with around 380 bottles coming out of each cask. They'll be available in Ireland, the U.S., Canada, France, Germany, Russia, and Holland, along with the Walsh Whiskey Distillery at Royal Oak in Ireland's County Carlow. On the business side, Australia's Seppeltsfield estate is expanding from wine into whiskey with a major investment in Australian whiskey holdings. The private equity group just completed its acquisition of Tasmania's Lark Distillery last week and also owns the Nant and Overeem distilleries as well. Terms of the deal were not announced, but the spirits business reports Seppeltsfield Estate Managing Director Warren Randall is now the largest individual shareholder in Australian whiskey holdings. The wine producer has been part of Australia's growing whiskey industry for years as a supplier of wine barrels to distillers, but this is its first investment in distilleries. We met Amir P. back in episode 588 in May of 2016. He's behind the revival of the historic James E. Pepper Distillery in Lexington, Kentucky. The distillery started production back in December and will open for tours starting this coming Thursday, July 12th. We'll have more on this next time around. And finally, here's an update on last week's story about the fire that shut down New York City's famous The Dead Rabbit Pub. We had reported just after the fire that it was in an adjacent building, but investigators now say it started in the Dead Rabbit's own ventilation system. And we have to give major credit to Steve, his last name not given, but he is one of the Dead Rabbit's staff members. According to their Twitter feed, Steve had just started his Sunday shift when he discovered the fire, turned off the gas line, and called firefighters in time to keep the damage to a minimum. The pub in Lower Manhattan is now set to reopen around July 19th. You can keep up with the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. Want to try one of the world's great whiskeys? Look for the Highland Park 18-year-old. It's been a favorite of judges in whiskey competitions around the world for years, and it just might become one of your favorites, too. Check out the entire range at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. And since I'm sitting on the front porch this time around, it makes perfect sense to start out with this one. MB Roland Distillery's next Pickin' on the Porch concert is this coming Saturday, July 14th in Pembroke, Kentucky. That same day is the NAV Center's Beer, Bourbon, Blues, and Barbecue Party in Cornwall, Ontario, Canada. Bourbon's Bistro in Louisville, Kentucky has a bourbon and cheese pairing event on July 19th. If you want to learn how to make whiskey instead of just drink it, Moonshine University in Louisville has a six-day long distillers course starting July 22nd at the Distilled Spirits Epicenter. The McAllen is bringing its immersive distillery and visitor experience to Vanderbilt Hall in New York City's Grand Central Terminal, July 25th through the 27th. Whiskey Live Perth is on the 27th and 28th in Perth, Australia, along with Whiskey Brothers, the only whiskey show in Johannesburg, South Africa, that same weekend. Right now, we have 201 different events on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have an event you'd like to add to the list, just use the contact form at the website and let us know about it. Redbreast fans have always cherished our whiskey's sherry notes, so we set out to embellish that character. Introducing the Redbreastless Stout Edition, a quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey finished in first fill Oloroso sherry casks from Spain's prestigious Bodegas Le Stout. Carrying Redbreast's trademark pot still spices and dark dried fruit notes, the Listeau edition is graced with an enduring sherry finish that would be better described as a final act. Discover the newest branch on the Redbreast family tree. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. Ken Lewis has done a lot of things in his life. He's been a teacher, climbed Denali in Alaska. 
built and ran a successful chain of liquor stores in Kentucky. And four years ago, he set all of that aside to start a new chapter in his life, a new riff, if you will. He and Jay Erisman left the party source behind to open up New Riff Distillery in Newport, Kentucky, just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. They've been laying down stocks of whiskey since then, while releasing the sourced OKI bourbon from the other side of the river at MGP. At the end of this month, the first bottles of New Riff bourbon will go on sale after what he hopes will be a world record bourbon toast on one of the bridges that connects Newport and Cincinnati. We talked about that new bourbon and New Riff's riff on the whiskey business. You could have easily released this a couple of years ago, but uh, decided to wait four years and do a bottled and bond for your uh, your first New Riff bourbon, right? Absolutely. Why? Uh, New Riff's all about quality. Our mission statement is to become one of the great small distilleries of the world. Now, that's a lofty goal. We might fall short, but I believe in lofty goals. And it's not about sell a lot of cases and get bought out. That's not anything on our agenda. We don't want to do it. We won't. We want to remain independent. It's not about uh, being the most profitable little distillery in the in the world. It's about quality. So uh, Bottled and Bond is absolutely a baseline of quality for us where it might be another distillery's 5% of their offerings. It's a, it's a, uh, a baseline for us that we'll uh, never We'll, we'll we'll never do do anything below that, so to speak. So that's what we decided to do a long time ago. Were you able to lay down enough stock four years ago to be able to uh, keep a bottled in bond going early on and have enough to uh, get you through those six month periods until you get to the next season? Yes, uh, but with Mark, with the uh, asterisk that again we have we don't have exactly the same goals as other distilleries. We're even though we're a small mid-major distillery, we're not interested in blanketing the United States and grabbing territory, as, and which leads to allocations. Our goal is we'll only o- open up a market if we can keep it fully in stock. So we're starting with Kentucky and Ohio. We're comfortable we can uh, fully supply those, and we're only going to enter other markets when we can keep them in stock on our core offerings. Now, we have talked before about... Uh you founding the distillery, selling the party source, the uh, retail store next door that you guys uh, had run for years because of the uh, three-tier rule. But what have you learned over the last four years that you didn't know when you started this distillery? Well, for starters, just uh, how expensive and complex starting a mid-sized distillery is. I thought somewhat naively that well, in the first couple of years, three years, until our product's ready, uh, you know, it's it's pretty much just going to be get things up and running, the production process going, and we can kind of sit back and twiddle our thumbs and watch the whiskey age. And it, it's proven to be much more complex and fascinating than that. So, and and then on the uh, the flip side of that, of course, is how phenomenally expensive a project like this is. The capital investment continues uh, unabated. It's not just building the distillery, but then there were rick houses, and now we're doing the bottling line and distribution facility and adding some uh, room for some a uh, sales team and marketing and brand architecture. So there's a lot of things that are a lot more complex and expensive than I ever imagined. Would you do it all over again? Absolutely. It's been a great ride. <laughs> uh, we, we love our whiskey. We feel good about it. We, we You know, when we started tasting even j- Three years ago, we started feeling okay, and our consulting master distiller, Larry Ibersold, who I know you know is and is a fantastic uh, master distiller, when he was telling us even early on after a year, year and a half, this is some good juice. You guys are going to be all right. And then we had, you know, Jimmy Rutledge, and then a whole parade of people over the years. Uh, it made us feel good that uh, we were on the right track. So it, it's so exciting. And then, then the, as you well know, uh, this is just the beginning, I mean, the end of the beginning. The journey just begins to become one of the great small distilleries of the world. We're going to, even to approach that goal, and, and, you know, we may never achieve it, and I'm not sure how we would know we achieved it anyway, but 
it's a 10 year process. At least we're holding back a third of everything to become older because that's where our reputation will get established. We have rye coming hundred percent malted rye, single malt project with the Kentucky regimen down the road. So there's so many things coming <laughs> that uh, I think it's going to keep me very, very alive and out of retirement. And you're still selling the uh, sourced stuff that you were getting from a, uh... Larry's place up at MGP back in the day, right? It's pretty much coming to an end. That was OKI, and uh, our final release has been 12-year. It became a sensation uh, and highly allocated and scarce. We're on a raffle system at the distillery, and the whole idea of that was to be a uh, Band-Aid or an interim product because even though we're a brand-new distillery, people take tours, they still expect to be able to drink some bourbon. So rather than give them immature juice, it's been wonderful to have a really good uh, aged bourbon from MGP uh, for people to uh, to taste. So it's done its job, and now everything will be under the new Rift label. You mentioned uh, tourists coming to visit the distillery. You are right across the river from Cincinnati. Have you seen a good, good inflow of tourists coming in from across the river and uh, people starting the bourbon trail up at your end of the place? Yes. Uh, I think increasingly people are recognizing that Cincinnati is a fantastic gateway to the bourbon trail, maybe dual loop start or end in Louisville, but include Cincinnati. We have a, you know, very popular airport and it's a 2 million plus city with lots of fantastic entertainment and dining options and great museums, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think we're making a lot of headway at bookending the, uh, the bourbon trail. So, Tourism is important. We have an event center here. We have about 30,000 people a year right now going through this this facility. So, and, and, and a number of people are on their way or have been to the main bourbon trail in central Kentucky. Let's just get the uh, logistics clear on the launch. You've got your big event coming up at the end of July, the uh, world's largest That's bourbon toast. Yes. And... Right after that is when New Rift Bourbon hits the market, correct? Yes. Uh, The first month, it's limited as we build stocks to supply stores and bars and restaurants in Kentucky and Ohio. So the first month for the entire, from July 31st through the end of August, we're selling product at the distillery only on a limited basis, one bottle a person. And then after that, uh, we'll have built some stocks and we're ready to distribute in Kentucky and Ohio fairly widely in stores, bars, and restaurants. And let's talk about the uh, toast on the 31st of July. You've got a big party planned for this, don't you? We have a big party. It's it's a media event. uh, And it's a way, the idea is that we have this wonderful bridge that's been, old railroad bridge that's been converted into a pedestrian bridge between uh, Kentucky and Ohio, Newport and downtown Cincinnati. And uh, we're bringing, we'll have about 1,500 people there to do a fast toast. The idea is not just our release of our bourbon, but we want to actually share bourbon tourism with greater Cincinnati. We're one metropolitan area. It's not just about northern Kentucky. When folks stay here, they're they're going to want to eat, drink, uh, and explore Cincinnati. And uh, so it's a way of like commemorating the uh, uh, sharing of tourism throughout greater Cincinnati. What comes next? After you get this bourbon on the market, what will we see after that? You mentioned rye. You mentioned single malt. What's coming down the road? Well, I think one of the most interesting things, and you'll appreciate this a lot, Mark, is that we have some, well, we like to say disruptive ways of going to market. And I think one of the the first one that I think will most interest folks listening to you uh, is that we are going to focus seriously on single barrel. Single barrel right now and single barrel barrel proof. And right now, as you well know, there's it takes maybe four months, five months to get a barrel. It's kind of a, a nuisance for the big distillers because they're selling all the product they can make. And this takes a little hand holding and comes up the production, the bottling line and so forth. They do it, but they don't embrace it. Uh, we're embracing single barrel. It's what the consumer wants. We love the singularity of single barrels. And we are uh, actually outfitting our brand new West Newport uh, warehouse and Rick houses. That whole campus in old historic buildings we've renovated is being developed as a great experience to bring in not just the trade, but also consumers and clubs to come through and have a two, three hour experience with us tasting with thieves right out of 
a uh, multitude of barrels and having and talking bourbon, learning bourbon, great education, having a wonderful experience and get that uh, product to them within three weeks. So we're even going to sell fractionals. We're going to sell quarters and halves so that more bars and more individuals can have a chance to experience barrel-proof single barrel. We fully expect to sell more than half of our product actually as single barrels. This would not be the first time that you've been somewhat disruptive in the spirits retail space. That's what you sort of specialized in when you were uh, running the party source, uh, with the flagship store essentially next door to New Riff. Yes, I firmly, I didn't know the word disruptive when I started doing it, but I think all of us have now embraced the concept that as uh, complex and as competitive as all businesses today. And, and, you know, we may be in a little boom, we're in a big boom right now, but eventually supply is going to catch demand. And, you know, to survive as a mid-major or to be a craft distiller with all the folks coming online, you're going to have to have some angles. You're going to have to have some niche. You can't go up against the uh, heritage distillers. They have wonderful product. They sell at very fair prices. They have great marketing budgets. They're very, very, very sophisticated, and they'll win every time. So we have to sort of work around them. We have to, you know, find an angle. And certainly I did that as a retailer. Uh, the party source has been wildly successful, and, and you know, the, the sign of success is that it's been widely imitated. And uh, our approach of going to market, we have several means, is to find that that angle and this is the way we can be we're big enough to have enough product to do single barrels and hundreds of them and we're also nimble flexible customer centric enough to handle the logistics of that kind of operation obviously you had to sell the party source and you sold it to your employees yeah. to move into yeah. the distilling business we yeah. have a lot of people who go into distilling from owning bars or from other fields but it's very rare for a retailer to become a distiller. Yes, as far as I know, I'm the only one. But you know, who knows? Was that something that you had to think long and hard about before you actually pulled the trigger on it? Well, the first thing, Mark, is that again, this is a very tough economic model uh, to go four years in our case with very little cash flow. It's it's and not to have investors and not to have venture capital money, which. No partners. You know, we want our independence and we're going to stay a family business and we're not trying to, to grow and sell out. So a lot of the money that's coming into distilling now, as you well know, is looking at a five, six year window and wants a return within that time, which usually can, with the capital investment and the marketing costs, almost certainly is going to mean selling out to someone to, to, to a larger company. So we are maintaining our independence and I thought long and hard about it. One, because even though it's been more daunting than I ever imagined and more expensive, I certainly knew there would be, it would, it would be expensive. And then the other thing is that, uh, you know, if this thing was just about making money, I never would have sold the party source. It was, it's always been a highly successful operation. Uh, I was kind of on easy street, but this is a great second act for me. And it's all about quality and it's all about having a fantastic team and building a product and becoming a great small distillery. And there's a source of pride and passion and determination and a legacy creation there that, that I, honestly, I never could have gotten out of retailing. There's a link to the New Riff website and details on that bourbon toast July 31st in the show notes for this episode at whiskeycast.com. And we'll have the tasting notes for the debut release of New Riff Bourbon soon at the website, too. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the classic Lagavulin 16-year-old, the Distiller's Edition, and the throwback 8-year-old Lagavulin at a whiskey shop near you. Find out more at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with the latest Compass Box release, the Delilah's 25th Anniversary Edition that honors Mike Miller's classic Chicago whiskey and live music bar. This blended scotch uses a bit of the original Compass Box Delilah's Edition from five years ago that John Glazer kept in the barrel. 
And the nose is honey sweet and very aromatic with notes of figs, muted spices, dried fruits, and just a touch of oak. The taste has spicy touches of allspice, ginger root, and white pepper on top, balanced by sweeter notes of honey, figs, and apricots underneath. The finish is long and well-balanced with lingering spices, dried fruits, and just a hint of honey. I'm scoring the Compass Box Delilah's 25th Anniversary Edition a 92. Now, let's look at the Michter's Toasted Barrel Finish Bourbon. This one takes the regular Michter's Bourbon and finishes it in toasted, not charred, new oak barrels. It's bottled at 55% ABV. The nose is oaky, tannic, and peppery, with underlying touches of vanilla, caramel, and honey. The taste is oaky and peppery, with chocolate fudge and caramel notes, and as the spices fade, the complexity increases, with honey and brown sugar notes coming out in the background, along with just a hint of ginger root. The finish is long and subtle, with hints of spice, caramel, and oak. It's nice, and I'm scoring the Michter's Toasted Barrel Finish Bourbon a 91. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, proud to announce a new grain-to-glass project where proprietary seed and unique mash bills re-examine the variables that go into making whiskey. See more at heavenhilldistillery.com blog. Think wisely, drink wisely. I received a sample of High West's 2018 edition of its Yippie Ki Yay Rye Whiskey a few days ago, and this one is unique compared to previous releases. It's a blend of straight rye whiskeys, and for the first time, it has some of High West's own barely legal straight rye, blended with older ryes from MGP and Barton. It's still bottled at 46% ABV, and the nose is nice, with black cherries, cinnamon candies, dried apricots, a hint of brown sugar, and just a slight nuttiness. The taste has notes of black cherries, berry cobbler, anise, honey, a slight herbal touch, and a good oakiness, and the finish is long and fruity, with touches of raspberry jam and a slight mintiness. I'm scoring the 2018 release of High West's Yippie Ki Yay Straight Rye, a 92. And if you look at the Yippie Ki Yay bottle, side by side with Wyoming Whiskey's new Steamboat Limited Edition Bourbon, you might notice some similarities. Namely, they both have a bucking horse and cowboy. In the case of Steamboat, that's the horse and cowboy that has become Wyoming's state symbol. You'll see it on license plates and even the University of Wyoming Cowboys football helmets. Steamboat Edition is a Wyoming-only bottling at 45% ABV that was blended for a lighter taste than the regular Wyoming whiskey bourbon. The nose has notes of fresh berries, a hint of caramel candy, subtle spices, and touches of vanilla and honey. The taste has berry cobbler sweetness balanced by spicy notes of black pepper and allspice, along with touches of caramel candy, vanilla, and a hint of butterscotch underneath. The finish is medium length and fruity. I'm scoring Wyoming Whiskey's Steamboat Edition a 90. Finally, here's one note on our tasting notes from last time around. I mentioned last week that Catoctin Creek's Roundstone Rye Hickory Syrup Cask Finish was bottled at 40%, and that was according to the label on the sample bottle the distillery provided. But after the podcast went out, Catoctin Creek told us on Twitter that it was actually bottled at a cask strength 58% ABV. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,200 different whiskeys at whiskeycast.com. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. This is what they sound like. Because you're a cheeky wee blighter. Dance like. I like that. This is what they do all day. Building the great character of Johnny Walker Black Label. Aging Hickey and Oak for 12 long years. Thanks. Oh, it's gorgeous there. 
What is character? It's giving a damn. You're not right, lassie. Which looks like this, as much as this. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Not the bloody game in the telly, Ella. A whiskey as bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Cup, cup. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Hope you had a chance to catch up on WhiskeyCast episodes this week. While we took a couple of days off for the Independence Day holiday, we're back to our regular schedule of two shows each week now. Let's open up the inbox for your voice, brought to you as always by Lot 40. Dave Kearns, at Real Whiskey Dave on Twitter, posted this note on our interview last time around with Johnny Mundell of Beam Suntory about the Great Isla Swim. This is amazing. Knowing at Johnny the Scot, I know how this journey has changed him. To hear him talk about it is magical. What a great listen. Thanks, Mark. At Simon Brooking, hashtag Great Isla Swim. And if you heard the interview last week, you'll know that Simon Brooking of Lafroig and Beaumore fame at Beam Suntory was responsible for Johnny getting into the Great Isla Swim in the first place. Jack Laughlin at the Barber of Figaro tweeted this note, listened to the latest, couldn't imagine braving the cold waters of Isla for that long. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, Johnny swam around Isla in an eight-day expedition with explorers Justin Fornal and Chad Anderson. They all fought off jellyfish bites as well as the wind and the waves. We also had an update on the hashtag Free the Whiskey campaign in British Columbia with details on a new report from the province's Blue Ribbon Panel tasked with making recommendations for changes in BC's liquor distribution system. Rob and Kelly Carpenter, who run the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society's Canadian chapter, tweeted this response. Thanks, Mark, for shining a light on this. Now we need BC's hospitality licensees to make some noise so the BC NDP doesn't bury the report and ignore it. The recommendations in the report are what bars, restaurants, customers, a.k.a. voters, have been asking for. By the way, the BC NDP is the new Democratic Party, which controls British Columbia's legislative assembly and government. Vancouver-based wine writer Anthony Gismondi also had this take on the report. Mark Hicken's report on the mess that is alcohol in this province is calm and measured. There is nothing new except for a balanced view assembled by an independent who understands the biz. Now, government needs the courage to implement the recommendations. This tweet from Lori Van Thiel in Seattle was not directed at us, but as a photographer, I agree 100% with her on this and thought it was worth sharing. Dear Hashtag Craft Distillers, I heart your passion for what you do. I also appreciate the long hours and funds you pour into your work. However, we need to talk labels. Take the time to pick a label material that is easily photographed. If it is not easy to see, people won't photograph it. Amen to that, Lori. I shoot a lot of bottle shots to go along with our tasting notes on the website, and if a label is hard to photograph, it's probably also not going to stand out well on a retailer's shelf, or especially in a row of whiskey bottles in a dark bar. Make those labels easy to read. We've had a lot of comments on the warehouse collapse at Barton 1792 over the last couple of weeks, and there seems to be a recurring theme. Brad Halpin posted this on our Facebook page. No! Bourbon is already too expensive. Though maybe they will release a special edition from the barrels in the collapsed warehouse, a la Snow Phoenix. That would be kind of funny. Gal Granov tweeted this from Israel. Glenn Fittick would immediately create a Sun Phoenix edition. Martin Siga tweeted from Ireland. Very special edition, dirt label bourbon. And Waterford Distillery's Mark Rainier tweeted this, 
Will there be an open-air maturation bottling? As you know, if you've ever listened to one of Mark Rainier's interviews here on WhiskeyCast, he can be a bit of a smartass. And following our tweet Wednesday with a photo of the aftermath in Bardstown, he also tweeted, And I just hired their chief engineer. Too soon, Mark. Way too soon. As for the future of that bourbon, though, Sazerac CEO Mark Brown has not given us any clues about what will happen with the barrels that survived the collapse. After all, they're just now starting to recover barrels from the debris pile and have no clue just how many will be usable. But let's keep in mind that a few years ago, one of the warehouses at Buffalo Trace was hit by a tornado that ripped the side off the building but did not damage a single barrel. A couple of years later, they released a special bourbon using the whiskeys from that warehouse and called it the Colonel E.H. Taylor Tornado Surviving Bourbon. So it would not surprise me if we see a 1792 bourbon along those lines in the future. Finally, had a lot of comments along these lines this week. This one is from Paul Letty at P. Letty on Twitter. Absolutely amazing to hear you on at Wait Wait this past weekend. Just now catching up on podcasts, yours included. Congratulations on the win. Whose voice did you pick? Yes, I was a contestant on NPR's Wait Wait Don't Tell Me last weekend in the Listener Limerick Challenge segment near the end of the show. If you haven't heard the show before, the idea is to listen to a news-related limerick and then fill in the last word. If you get two out of three, you win. Not to brag, I got all three. The prize, any one of the show's hosts or panelists recording your voicemail message. Now, I have not decided yet which one to pick, but I am open to suggestions. We've posted a link to the Wait Wait episode from June 30th, 2018 at WhiskeyCast.com. And if you have a suggestion, let us know on Twitter or Facebook. Of course, if you have something else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can also post it there. And we're also on Instagram and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast, too. You can also check out the Your Voice page at WhiskeyCast.com. And the email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close out the show now with Behind the Label, our look at the science, history, and other things that make whiskey unique. In our Tasting Notes segment a few minutes ago, I mentioned the Michter's Toasted Barrel Finish Bourbon. And that brings us to this email I got this week from Peter Hosek in the Czech Republic. Hi Mark, I like your new section Behind the Label, and I would have a question. I got a leaflet about Woodford Reserve, which for the doubled wood expression, claims that the bourbon is twice barreled, which I assume means it's recasked during the maturation, and the second barrel is deeply toasted before a light charring. How does the latter process work? Thanks for your help and thanks for the great source of information. I especially like all the insightful interviews that the new two episodes a week format makes space for. Although, tongue in cheek, I have to admit I have troubles now in summer to keep up with the amount of recording, as I play tennis instead of going for jogging, and I haven't figured out yet how to listen to the podcast during a tennis game. Maybe some listeners can give advice. Well, Peter, you could always pair your phone with a Bluetooth speaker next to the tennis court, or use a pair of wireless earbuds. As for toasting compared to charring, This is one of those areas where cooperages like to keep things a bit mysterious. I've been to Brown Foreman's Cooperage in Louisville, where they make barrels for Woodford Reserve, and the one thing they would not show me was how they toast barrels. It's a trade secret. And, by the way, Independent Stave Company has areas of its cooperages where they don't allow photos for the same reason. We have shown photos and videos of barrel charring many times, though, on the WhiskeyCast website and on our social media feeds. That's the spectacular part of the cooperage, where they take a gas flame and literally set the inside of the barrel on fire for a minute or so. 
It leaves the staves charred and cracked while caramelizing the natural sugars inside the wood. Toasting, though, is more of a low and slow method. It's used mainly for wine barrels, and instead of hitting the staves with what amounts to a flamethrower, the heat is applied more gently over a longer period of time. It has the same effect of caramelizing the sugars inside the wood, while not creating that essence of campfire smoke you might find in bourbon from a charred barrel. And remember, they are using a new barrel again, so toasting it instead of charring it heavily creates a more mellow flavor compared to taking that bourbon and putting it back into a new charred cask. They do char it just a little bit, though, just to stay in compliance with regulations. Peter, I hope this helps, and thank you for the suggestion. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. That's also where you'll find links for our WhiskeyCast HD videos and the WhiskeyCast Tasting Panel podcast, along with the latest whiskey news, events, cocktail recipes, and a whole lot more, including a complete archive of past episodes. If you haven't done it already, please consider leaving a review or rating for WhiskeyCast on your favorite podcast app. Those comments do help other whiskey lovers discover the show when they're looking for podcasts. You'll find us all week long on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. WhiskeyCast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you twice each week from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.